So hello everyone, welcome back to Algorithm Podcast. Today I have a very special guest. Uh, it's Mark Weens with us. Mark, you're a traveler, blogger, content creator, food enthusiast. You see how nicely I packed the word eater? Like food enthusiast. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Yeah, and I'm joined by Adnan today, who's gonna help me out interviewing Mark about his endeavors in, in Baku. Welcome, really glad to, uh, to have you Thank you so here. much, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. How long you've been here? In Azerbaijan now, I think about a week. About a week. Yeah. Wow. I have to ask, how many lunches, dinners, how many meals you had? Oh, at least, well, at least, at least two lunches, two, three lunches, two well, dinners. We've, we've been eating well. You've been eating well. We've been eating well. So what was, what's your favorite so far? Uh, I've really enjoyed the the dishes kind of the the stewed meat dishes especially the lamb dishes that include different fruits like the sour plums the sour cherries that kind of like sour fruitiness pairing together with lamb is so good uh and then also that uh pilaf along with the the lamb with the different herbs yeah i can much well uh sa sa um, sabzi. 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 sabzi yeah oh, yeah. oh wow that's, that's my favorite for sure oh, great dish and then what about you you use the opportunity to eat some delicious Azerbaijani food? Oh yeah, it's it's my first time. I've never had Azerbaijani food before. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is not, you can then never have too much Azerbaijani food. So you- You're right. You're, you're definitely right. It's just, I'm not used to uh, taking seven to nine meals a day. Oh wow. And each meal, it's another seven to nine courses. I mean, just today alone, we had like in total nine places and each had several courses just you today. You guys look suspiciously skinny for like food people who had like seven to nine dishes. Some, some may call us the witches. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Uh, I don't want to start any rumors here, but you guys look good. <laughs> Definitely for that. Okay. And what, 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 was the, what was the region, what was the area that impressed you the most? Yeah, in other uh, so far. I especially liked Ismaili. Really? I mean, especially, well, mainly because we, we were able to do this amazing hike through the mountains to this just pristine village in the mountains, isolated, peaceful, surrounded by nature, That's beautiful really culture. Good. So that, that experience really stands out that we did. Yeah. Delicious food, everything just natural that they produce. Did yeah. you have any image about Azerbaijan before you came or that was completely out of the blue? Not a, not a lot. I mean, I think, I think if I were to think of Azerbaijan before ever coming here, I would mainly get a picture of Baku, yeah. which is something that is more publicized. Uh, whereas I think Baku is amazing. It's a, it's an amazing city, but really the, the beauty of the mountains and the, the people, the cultures that you find outside of Baku and the countryside is, is really something special. Well, I totally agree with you. And uh, we've been recently talking about this with Adnan, that there's so much uh, great potential when you go outside of Baku and you start exploring the country. I've been lucky to start exploring the country in my early 20s or like even teens. And when I started working as a guide and Adnan, you also started exploring as a person quite young, right? Um, I actually didn't because no. I started exploring it recently because at young age, I was not living here. Ah, yeah. So so for me, um, my whole project, Re Azerbaijan, is I'm not only introducing Azerbaijan to both local and international uh, community, but I'm exploring it for myself. So, yeah. Oh, well, that's definitely a good cause. So, Mark, you're traveling around the globe. You're exploring new destinations. You're meeting new people and you're eating delicious food. How can I have your life? <laughs> uh, well, I think, I think it's just, I mean, it's, I think we, you probably have the passion also for traveling and for seeing, just experiencing new places and meeting new people. For me, it's especially the, the passion for trying the food and trying food that especially is especially authentic and traditional food that really makes the country or the culture unique. That's what I would really like to, to seek out. 
So I think, um, I mean, whatever is your goal, anybody, anybody has a, has a chance, you know, yeah. Every, everybody can, can do the same thing. Yeah, for sure. But tell me a little bit more. I think you started traveling in the quite young age, right? You, you were born and raised in US, then you moved to France. Yeah, your... I did. I did my, my, I also moved quite a lot with my parents. Yeah, exactly. Uh, traveling to different countries, living in different places. You lived in Kenya for we a while? We lived in Kenya. Wow. We can you tell in... us a little bit more about that? Yeah. I, I think for the most, for most of my growing up years, I lived in Kenya. Uh, but before that we lived in Congo in like central Africa. Okay. I lived there for three or four years, uh, which was an amazing experience even though I was young back then, but I really enjoyed the nature. I really enjoyed just being in a place that was like far removed from a major city in the countryside. Then we ended up moving to Kenya. And then I went to most of my growing up school years in Kenya, which I, I enjoyed as well. Also going to an international school and meeting people from all over the world. So I, I was surrounded by friends from Ethiopia, from Kenya, from Korea, from Europe, from North America, from Asia, friends from all over the world. And that was like really like set a foundation for me for wanting to learn more about cultures and countries and also the food because we'd have lunch. I'd have a friend from Korea bringing like their lunch, some gimbap. I've had, I'd have a friend from Ethiopia bringing Ethiopian food. We'd all like get together at lunch and start to share our lunches together. And that gave me like so much inspiration. I was like, oh, I have to go to Korea to eat that. I have to go to Japan to eat that. I have to go, I have to, go to that original country where it's from to taste the real thing. Wow, that's a great, that's a great inspiration to like to travel. So that was, that was part of my inspiration for wanting to travel as soon as I could. And you're currently based in Thailand. Yes. How did that work out for you? Yes. So after I, f I went back to the US, I was in university. I finished with the university. But that entire time I said, I, I really want to get out. I want to go to travel as soon as I finish with university, as soon as I graduate. So I, I've traveled around. I, I finished with university. I traveled around for a few months. Uh, eventually, I ended up in Thailand um, with Nada, with I ended up in Thailand. I kept on traveling a little bit more and I had a friend, a good friend of mine who said from the US, who said, I want to come meet you. Where are you at? And I was in the Philippines at that time, but I said, okay, I think I can get back to Thailand quite easily. That's a good hub. So my friend met me there. We both went to Bangkok. And at that time, both of us were pretty much broke. So I said, okay, let's just stay in Thailand. It's a really nice place. Of course, the food is delicious. It's a great lifestyle. There's lots of things to do. So we taught English there for a year. Um, and during that time is when I ended up meeting my wife and eventually got married and that's also awesome. stayed ever since. That's great. That's a really great story. So you just said that you also teaching English. So I did, I did for a year, just for, for a year. year. So yeah. can you tell, can you tell about like, did it help you to connect with the local community? Did they give you the opportunity because you were a teacher to, you know, feel more close to the, to the local? Yeah. I mean, for me, teaching English was never really something I was that interested in. It was mainly just kind of a stepping stone to blog and to make videos and to pursue a, pursue something with food. So it was kind of like a, it was, it was a good experience, but it was never something I was really passionate about. Uh, I was still during that time, I was still using that time to explore Thai food and to eat as much as I could try new dishes every single day. I just go somewhere and try a different, a different Thai dish. So during that time I used it to earn a little bit of money, but then also to really try to explore more food and to make started making videos about food. Okay. I see. So th that's an interesting thing. You said that the, the passion into discovering new food, that's what kept driving you. And if I would say this to my friends that I want to travel the world to eat some food, they'll call me a foodie. I would be like, come on, 
<laughs> you don't need to explore the world <laughs> to have a good food. But for you, that, that became a thing, right? That was the first theme of the blog that you have started. Yeah, yeah, by all means. I mean, I mean, I think it is, it is amazing. I mean, you have any international city around the world, major international city, and they do have amazing, it's a melting pot, you know, like with so many foods, so many people from around the world in one place, often with restaurants that represent some of the bigger populations of that, that city. And so it is incredible to find like, I mean, if you're in a city, a major city to find all the different ethnic diversity and the, the restaurants. But even, even that, I mean, when you go to that actual country to experience it, I think Adnan and I were talking like, you know, Japanese food, you can find amazing Japanese food outside of Japan, but it has a different feel when you're in Japan. You know, it's, it's just the ambience, the atmosphere, the, even if you were to be able to taste the same exact Japanese food, like in a different country, somehow it wouldn't have the same like aura. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's just, there's just a feeling. And because it's not just food, it's, it's, it's the it's atmosphere. The, yes. Yeah, it's the yep. vibes that you it's, get. It's everything. It's sensory. Uh, and so I think, I mean, even, even I think, you know, like if you're in Japan and you're, you're walking up to the restaurant that even starts to be part of the experience. Yeah. So everything is involved. And so when you have a, have the, the chance to visit that country to eat the food, it's just that much more meaningful. Wow. Now you got me really inspired to travel. <laughs> Adnan, how far are you willing to travel in order to get good food? I, I actually did do such things when I was, um, when I used to live in Europe, I was based in Prague and I was traveling constantly, just, uh, exploring, uh, during the weekends. And I found this amazing restaurant, uh, in Austria, in Vienna that was serving just the most wonderful uh, Vienna schnitzel that I ever had in my life. And you know how sometimes you have that craving for a certain food and you can do anything for it. I would, I would clear my schedule, cancel all my meetings, drive four hours to Vienna from Prague, have that schnitzel drive four hours back. Wow. You are a foodie as well. <laughs> Four hours to get a schnitzel. But I'm not asking you, Mark, because I think you traveled like what, 12 hours to get a nice, I don't know, sushi or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I th for sure there are some meals that are worth flying across the world just to eat. Well, I'm sure you had many like delicious meals in your, in your life and, and while you've been traveling. And I don't want to ask you for a favorites, but something that comes from the top of your head, something that really stands out. You have anything? Maybe um, from a recent trips? Recently, I just took a trip to Spain. Yeah. Um, and there's this, there's this one beef restaurant where this amazing chef slash rancher, he, raises oxen uh, much older than a typical uh, beef or cattle would be raised for, for food. Uh, so he really raises them, he takes care of them, he treats them extremely well, and he has this amazing steakhouse where he ages the meats, where he, it's within this old wine cellar cave, the restaurant, um, it's called El Capriccio, and so he, it's truly like some of the most intensely flavored beef that you'll ever have in your life. It's just unbelievable. He does this cecina, which the, with this oxen that is covered in salt. It's salt cured for a month. Wow. Okay. Then it ages in a cave for four years. <laughs> he shaves off a four piece. Years. It just, it's one of the greatest flavors like most intense, beefy, just melt in your mouth complexity. 
like absolutely unbelievable. I could not even believe the flavor that was coming out of that. The, the umami explosion is almost out of control. Well, I'm definitely getting restaurant recommendations <laughs> from you at the end of the podcast. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to <laughs> clear my schedule for tomorrow. <laughs> fly, drive, <laughs> just fly to Spain. <laughs> Quite literally, <laughs> drive, not to fly, but to drive to Spain. What about you? Yeah, Anna? something stands out, like any specific meal you had in your uh, life. Yes, uh, and we we were speaking about uh, food in Japan yeah. just recently. And I speak about Japan all the time. You know that we share that. Yeah. It's it's the unagi. It's the unagi rice box. Yeah. Oh, oh, and um, it might not be mo the most um, exquisite or the most uh, let's call it luxurious dining experience uh, or that I've had, but for some reason, it just maybe tickled the right taste buds, let's say. And yeah, I've, there's, there's a time, there's this, I can't remember the name, name now, but it's a very legendary Unagi restaurant in Tokyo. Yes. Like way off the beaten path in somebody's home, in a neighborhood outside of the city. And there's, I mean, always a line but you have to wait at least hours to get in. And then just, you know, like just waiting in that line, you're anticipating it. And then once you taste that, that box of unagi two hours later after standing in line, it's just like, just unbelievable the way it just hits you. And the satisfaction is almost unexplainable. I think, I think it's the perfect balance of that meal of flavors and tastes and fragrances as well because yeah. once you open that box that steam those fragrances that come out of it and it's an experience that you have prior to tasting it that engraves in your memory and you keep on thinking about it once in a while with you know a light smile on your face um wishing you had it available <laughs> at any moment. <laughs> Let me share my Japan story with you. It was like 2009, 2010. It was December and I got like soaked in rain and it was really cold. So I was close to Hatagaya station in Tokyo and I found this very small, like off the beaten track place. And I go in there and I'm, and I'm trying to explain in Japanese saying like, I don't know what I want, but I'm just really cold. Can you get me something hot? And I had uh, had really nice miso soup, and then that's the place where I had uh, the most delicious shabu shabu in my life. Oh, and oh. that's something that I'm still looking for. And usually I have this rule like I I don't like to come back to the same places twice when I'm traveling, especially. But I had to broke this rule. Okay, I'll admit it. I broke this rule several times <laughs> while yes. I was living in, in Tokyo, <laughs> yes. and I came back to this place just to have this food. And then after like uh, one year. I came to Tokyo uh, for an exhibition, for a travel exhibition at Jata. And I had to travel 14 stations on the subway just to get to this restaurant yes. <laughs> and had this meal. So yeah, I know I know what, what you mean when you're like ready to travel for food. Yeah, I did it. You know, it well. actually takes me back to a conversation we had on our way uh, here that in Azerbaijan, uh, we have a very limited understanding of the Japanese cuisine, unfortunately. And um, it's so much more. And I'm sure it's not only in Azerbaijan. I mean, the, if we take the majority of the world, probably for them, when you say Japanese cuisine, the only thing that comes to mind is sushi. Yeah. But you just mentioned shabu shabu, which is a wonderful, wonderful meal. So comforting, especially in winter. There is the sukiyaki alternative to that. There's the yakiniku. There's all types of soba. We've talked about the uh, the cold served soba, oh, yeah. which is just perfect. Love it. Um, and 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 I want to say that this this is something that probably you 
notice as you travel the world and um does that apply pretty much to every other country as well like what i mean is that you travel somewhere i'm sure when you came here before, prior to coming to azerbaijan you've maybe searched some food um you've had some understanding about the food uh how bigger was the variety that you see now as you are here prior than than the one that uh, you had the understanding the image you had prior to coming okay well before before answering that I think for sure this is the case with every single country. And for me, I have a lot of experience with most of my experience living in Thailand is with Thai food. And so Thai food is pretty popular around the world. You'll find like Thai restaurants all over the world. But when you go to Thai restaurants, typically outside of Thailand, it's like they have the same 10 dishes. You know, there's green curry, there's red curry, there's pad thai. There's possibly something stirred with stir fried with basil, like chicken stir fried with basil. But it's these standardized same dishes, pineapple fried rice. These are like this is like what everybody around the world thinks about Thai food. Now, when you're in Thailand, it's like, okay, these dishes exist, but there's there's so there's so much more. It's like so many thousands more dishes. Like for instance, Pad Thai. It's like everybody knows about Pad Thai. When you're in Thailand, sure, you'll find Pad Thai. But there's so many other dishes to eat that you barely even, you have to like search out for Pad Thai rather than just like step in a restaurant and order Pad Thai. Um, and so I think, I mean, and then and then on top of that, you know, you'll, you get into every region and it's a totally different set of dishes and cuisine and you get into even more remote places and it's like, totally different that people would not even like know that's anything remotely similar to Thai food that they have on a menu somewhere across the world. So I do think this is the case with so many, so many countries as well. And which is also a huge reason to travel for food to that country. Because if you're typically, if you are experiencing that restaurant in a different country, it's, it might be good. It might be authentic, but it's still limited in the different, uh, even if in the ingredients they're able to get, what they're able to make. And even, even because, I mean, every country is so diverse in itself where you'll find so many cuisines within a single country. As far as Azerbaijan is concerned, um, I'm sure that's the case as well. And I think, I, I think again, especially when you start getting into some of the the further regions of Azerbaijan I, I like you like you even mentioned um even even maybe some people that are living in Baku might have not even seen that dish before yes we've actually met my friend today accidentally remember uh -huh. <clears throat> uh -huh. and we told him we our first stop uh after he came to Baku our first stop was uh, Gach. We went to Gach, and in Gach and Shaki, in that region, they have this um, meal. It's called Girs. Uh, that's that was the first um, meal, traditional, home cooked. It was home cooked. We didn't go to a restaurant. Went to this lovely, lovely, amazing family we found there. It was in the middle of the mountains in the Achchai. Uh, village and we're surrounded by these beautiful uh, mountains with the river flowing right in front of us and they cooked that gears right in front of us and today we stumbled upon my friend that he also met uh, yesterday I think uh, and he asked him about his food experience in Azerbaijan. And when he mentioned Girs, he didn't even know about it. So we had to show him the picture. We had to show him the videos. And he still didn't know. He's like, oh, I didn't know such food exists. Completely. And I have to go. There's one more thing try that's it. common uh, between me and Adnan. We also love those 
I know, I know how to call them like trashy restaurants. I don't want to like in the Chef. way of been with us today. Oh. Yeah, you been, where you guys been? Do you know uh Larma Lasse? Yes, for sure. Yeah, that's that was one of the places we've oh, been to. Okay. Is that the is that the Lamb Alley? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Lamb Alley, yeah. Oh. That's he, legendary. We love this place. What a- and again, uh, getting back to the topic of like being popularized, as we discussed, like popularized uh, f- some food from Sheki or Lankara. These restaurants by themselves are also not popular here. And I know, for example, a place um, in, in Bilga, when there is a guy who built basically out of the cardboards, like a small room, and then he has a couple of benches and he serves only kebabs. There is no menu. There is no start. You just come and he starts bringing food, start bringing meat. So the only way to like end <laughs> the feast is to tell tell him that you're leaving. And that's where the meat stops. If you don't say that, he will continue bringing you yes. meat. And it's amazing. It's really, really good. So, yeah, there's so much to discover, even, even with Mbaku. Like, yes. You know. No, today, yeah. going to that um, place, the meat, the lamb alley, as he called it. It was my first time, and I was I was surprised by how many people were actually there. Yeah, and it was busy. It was chaotic. There was yelling, screaming, uh, shouting, even cursing. <laughs> that thing we did not understand, but yes, it was there. But it was beautiful. Um, you want to talk about what you yeah had yeah there? lambs flying around, <laughs> uh, just people ordering all their different cuts of cuts of lamb, you know, and they 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 serve everything from nose to tail, you know. So like uh, we went there especially for because we had already eaten some more standard kebabs before going there. Uh, we went there especially to eat the jaw. Okay, yeah. With the tongue and the testicles. Okay. Which were both fabulous. Oh, incredible. The testicles were in particularly delicious. You know how we call it here in, in our language? Do you tell them? No. <laughs> yeah. We call it the white meat. The white meat. It sounds much better. It's very like, polite. Yeah. It's very polite. polite. Yes. Would you like meat. a portion of the white meat? <laughs> <laughs> and some people who, are not, who, are not, who does not know that, what does it mean, they go like, like if you're in, in some restaurant, like, would you like a white meat? They go like, yeah, sure. <laughs> then it hits them. <laughs> they know exactly what it is. <laughs> nice. I'll I'll share a secret. Go ahead. <laughs> I was one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> no way. That was my first experience with white with meat. meat. <laughs> wow. Okay. It was it was right after I um, <laughs> came back. To Azerbaijan. Yeah. After not, I mean, we lived here for a very long time. <laughs> so for me, white meat is like the breast of chicken. You know? <laughs> so, so, so they're serving food. The food is going around, and the waiter <laughs> asks, "Would you like some white meat?" I said, "Yes, sure." And um, he serves it. I see that the shape is off. Yeah. A bit. Slip I'm like, okay, <laughs> I mean, how bad can it be? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's chicken. <laughs> it's just maybe a different cut, different way of preparation. Maybe the cook did something of his own with it. Yeah. But it's chicken. And then I tried it. And I'm like, okay, it's not chicken. <laughs> what is it? And then I was told what it was. <laughs> Never been the same again. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we, we've been there. <laughs> but but it's, but it's also part of this bigger dish called jizbiz. I don't know if you had it. Oh, but he's he's gonna have it tomorrow. Oh, you're gonna have it tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yes, it's that uh, mix of minced of, of liver of organs. And yes. Yeah. Okay. It's oh, really fantastic. Good. Yes. Great. You know, it's in, and my favorite thing about jizbiz is you'd be very surprised to hear. Like, if you picture a person who says, my favorite meal is jizbas, you would think about, like, I don't know, 50-plus male with a nice mustache who, 
like has his kebabs with vodka. And yeah, it's it's common for this person to say, but in reality here in Baku, you can meet like a really cute girl, like, and she'll be like, I don't know, I only eat like, uh, I don't know, like uh, a vegan <laughs> desserts, etc. but also just this. <laughs> and you go like, wow. Yes. I heard it. I heard it quite yes. a lot of people saying, well, I, I people love just this. love it. It, you, because it, it it's connected to the childhood, I guess. Because you we can't all, refuse uh, having it. Exactly, it's it's just too too good to refuse. You you you'll try it tomorrow. It's that mixture of ingredients mm, of mm. flavors, and because they are chopped so thinly and, uh -huh. and and such small cube pieces, they interact with each other in, in the most beautiful way and. You get the scoop, and you're in heaven. Oh, yeah! Now, now you're excited for tomorrow. Yes, very. <laughs> I did just put the bar really high. Yeah, you did. Like, I tend to do that. Yeah, well, you need to call someone. I said it. Don't yeah. screw up. Tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark, I have a question for you. So, there are like plenty of people who watch your channel. Like, how many subscribers you have? Nine million on YouTube. About. About, about wow. About that, nine million. That's really great. Thank you. So you have 9 million subscribers. You have God knows how many subscribers on Instagram. And people watching you and probably sitting in their homes and thinking, I want to do that. I also want to start traveling. But they don't for a couple of reasons. They're anxious. They haven't stepped, uh, I don't know, uh, outside their country mm -hmm. for, for a while or in their lives. What would you say will be your advice for new travelers? How would you encourage people to start traveling? Like traveling, but also vlogging or making at content least just or, traveling okay well i mean i think again like we've been talking is that every every city every country no matter where you are has something to offer there's something to learn about no matter where you are i think i think like you could spend your whole life exploring your backyard and keep discovering things I mean, your what's in your vicinity. So you can, I mean, depending on budget, depending on your situation, every, all of us are in different situations. But you start start small, start where you are, um, start meeting like-minded people that you can do trips with, that you can go to eat. People that love to eat, hang out with people that love to eat and love to explore different foods or try different things. Um, and then you can just go from there. And once you, I mean, you can continue, you can eventually maybe a place that interests you and have set it, set it a goal to, to go there, uh, make it your priority. You know, I think, I think also, again, I consider it a huge privilege to be able to travel. It's something that not nearly everyone is able to do depending on situations but those but the people who like do you know like if you make it a, a real priority and work up to that goal that priority everything you do by budgeting by by doing what it takes you know if it's it's if it's really something you would like to do uh just really shoot for that just go for that yeah, that's an awesome advice. So you think that there was a notion when the COVID hit and travel industry was hit really badly and at some point people were saying, oh, people will stop traveling because they're anxious. But in reality, what we see right now in, this, in the industry that actually it completely took off because people were eager to, to travel and now that's all that interest now just it, it's skyrocketed across like mm -hmm. in staycations mm -hmm. international travelers what was your uh feeling when the when the lockdowns happened have you thought like oh there will be a long way coming back or you were certain that as soon as this is over you'll be on the road again i mean i was i was i was optimistic i, w I didn't really know i guess there there's a moment there's a while when you didn't really know how long it would carry on and when there were, you know, as soon as things started looking okay, then there'd be a new variant and then you go back to square one. 
Uh, so I was, I wasn't sure how long it would take, but I was, I was always optimistic, you know, like people, people love to, to travel. People love to, to keep, um, going places, seeing new things. And so I think, I think, I mean, even when international borders were closed and airports were closed and yet maybe domestic travel was still open, domestic travel was booming. And that's how it was in Thailand for a while. Um, international borders were closed, but people then decided to just travel around Thailand all places because people still wanted to move. People wanted to go see places. So I think it's not everyone, of course, loves to travel. But I think the the people who love to travel and love to see new things, they like you always got to find a way to to keep going. There is a saying that travel is the only thing that makes you rich. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean experiences, experiences, um, for sure. And now, were, were were you anxious when when the COVID hit that you will not be back on the road soon? Or yes, very much so. Where were you already? Here I now? was no, I was in Belize. Oh, okay, I was in Belize. And we, it didn't really stop us from traveling completely because, as Mark said, we started traveling around the country we were based in. Uh, but the eagerness of not being able to travel long distances, it was present. The eagerness... Um, um, the fear, not eagerness, the fear of not being able to travel long distances was there. And it's natural that people kicked off by traveling even more than they used to uh, before COVID hit. And I think a lot of it also has to do with YouTube because people got attached to YouTube more during the lockdown and they were watching travel shows a lot going back to even older videos of their favorite youtubers and that actually brings me to a question to mark that did you notice a spike in your older uh videos from youtube during COVID? Somewhat. Somewhat. A bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, a gain in, in views, I believe. During especially the, I think it was maybe the first six months when pretty much the whole world was on lockdown. During that period, there was, was definitely a bit of an increase in, in overall views. And I think there was just kind of a, a buzz on YouTube at that point because just pretty much the whole world was sitting at home, kind of bored, watching as much content as they could get a hold of. And probably making lists. Yeah. Making lists of places they want to travel, they want to see once this is all over. And so maybe that is one of the YouTube probably and people like you, Mark, one of the reasons people did start to travel more and travel to different destinations, new places. New places are being discovered now more frequently than they used to be before. Yeah, that's also a very interesting trend. I think it, it's moving even in the popular destinations, like I would say in France, Italy, people still travel in those countries, but they tend to explore smaller cities and villages and explored areas. Do you mm -hmm. keep track of how many countries you've been to? Do you have a number? I don't like, I don't specifically keep track, but kind of generally. Like, are you in, in about, hundreds? About, no, I don't think, not at a hundred yet, probably 80 or 90. Okay, do you know where you're going next? I don't. You don't? <laughs> no plans yet. Well, I'm going to head back to, we're heading back to Thailand after this, uh, after Azerbaijan. Gonna be at home probably for a couple weeks or months and we'll see but no I, I i actually don't have anything planned right now okay adnan do you keep a list no no i don't have a number but i'm i'm not in as much as he is but 
in about 40s, maybe f- pushing 50. Pushing 50, that's nice. Maybe, but there's a long, long list of places you want to visit mm-hmm. that I do want to visit. Okay, gentlemen, give me a wish list. I'm really eager to hear. Like Places to visit? Where you want to go next, like as a wish list. As a wish list. Um, I'd love to visit... Hmm. Let me think about it. Maybe Adnan, you go first. Adnan, you go first. I would love to go to Nepal. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, for sure. I would love to go to Nepal. I haven't been to Pakistan, and oh. recently talking about Pakistan food experience. I saw that video on YouTube. Oh, that oh was Pakistan a great is one. absolutely. I, I cannot fantastic. wait, and I'm already planning on going there just for the food and i'm sure there's much more than the food but it's the food that's taking me there now uh but yes i've always wanted to go to nepal Uh, i've always wanted to see new zealand new zealand okay new zealand um and again recently thanks to mark my interest just grew more to see senegal he's been telling and showing so many interesting things about it senegal is amazing yeah but there 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 is a long list of countries that i would want to visit and it there's no it doesn't go by the numbers first second third they keep on switching once in a while yeah like uh pakistan was always on the list but now it became like a priority yeah so yeah but there is a list a long one you surprised me. <laughs> you surprised me. Yeah, you haven't mentioned a, a European country. I think you've been all over Europe already. That's I funny. haven't been all over Europe, and Europe is a beautiful place. It's an amazing place. But the countries that I want to see are new worlds, not yeah. new countries. It's a completely different experience. It's a completely different culture. There is nothing in common between the countries that I want to visit where Europe has some things, yes. quite some things in common. Cultural, historical yes. time. So sure. having traveled 15 or uh, a bit more European countries, um, kind of know what to expect, and I kind of know what common things they have. But I want to explore places. And also a big part of me wanting to explore new places such as Nepal and Pakistan. Azerbaijan played a big, big part in it because when I started traveling around my own country and I realized how many beautiful places, how many beautiful cultures, we have so many ethnicities, we have so many nationalities, we have so many cultures, mixed in a perfect harmony splattered across the whole country and traveling getting to know them getting to know their culture um, getting to know trying their food and seeing both nature and historical places that i haven't even heard of it made me realize that if this is happening to me within the borders of my own country there's a whole world that i don't know about well definitely. there's a whole world that mm-hmm. i don't see on instagram oh yeah <laughs> that's a big one you know and this uh it it did change we're gonna talk about instagram by the way in a minute are you ready with your, with your <laughs> yeah yeah list? yeah shoot <laughs> yeah uh i'd love to visit iraq wow okay i'd love to visit syria uh which i think i mean both Places have contributed so much to the the world of food, yeah, definitely. and cultures. Um, I'd love to visit Mongolia, Ooh, just for the for the uniqueness of their culture. I'd love to visit, yeah, so many. I mean, still so many places I I would love to visit as well. Morocco, I've never been to Morocco. Yeah, Morocco is definitely on my list. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then on top of that, you know, like countries returning to countries, you know, like you've so many places where you just scratched the surface yeah. and there's so much more to discover. I mean, 
think of a country like India, you could, I mean, you, you could can spend your him. your lifetime there and never <laughs> even never even get close to exploring everything in India or China. Uh, Turkey, I'd Ooh. love to go back to Turkey to explore a lot more as well. Yeah, well, I I, I fully agree with you. I, it's funny because. Morocco is also on my list. Mm. Definitely. I would love to go there. Mongolia, I haven't really given it a great thought, but now since you mentioned it, <laughs> my name is Chinggis. I don't know. I think I should go to Mongolia. No, like <laughs> and discover yourself. There. Discover <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> I can be like on the journey of self discovery. You know, life. Mongolia is a beautiful place. It is, it is, I know. I've I've um I've had some friends. Um uh, we went to same school in Tokyo, and they introduced me to the Mongolian culture, to the food. Um, they were really nice people, and it is so much more than we know about it. And it has some beautiful places, and definitely worth visiting. Mm-hmm. I, I I join Mark that yes, I'd like It'd to see cool. it too. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question, and then I think we can wrap up. It's regarding Instagram. Mark, do you think that what you're doing with your content is kind of anti-Instagram in terms of travel trends? Because on Instagram, travel trends are like, they show you those, I don't know, go-to places, beautiful pictures, you know, these luxury resorts are all over the place, and this blue water and all that. And then there's you whose content is about go off the beaten path, try to discover something authentic. So do you find this, uh, your content being I mean, juxtaposed against this mainstream? No, I mean, I think, I think fortunately there's so many of us who love food and who are so passionate about food. And I think because food, one of the great things about food is that it's not only delicious and entertaining and fun. It's also something we actually need. Yeah. And something like every human shares that we we need food for nutrients for for life. And so it's kind of both of these coming together. And I think so I think that's partly why like so many people are passionate about food and love food and love to watch food. And love to see the process of food being prepared differently in different places that you're not familiar with. So, fortunately, I think I think it's uh, there's a big audience for food, and people can just watch food nonstop. Uh, and and social media is a great platform for sharing food. Well, speaking of social media, how can people find you on, on social media? Um. Usually, I mean, just searching my name, Mark Weens, Instagram, YouTube. And what's the name of your blog? And my blog is called Migrationology, which is the idea was always to be traveling, but at a at a very slow pace and really stopping somewhere to experience the culture. So it was always more of a mig- migration instead of a fast-paced travel. But I've sort of gotten away from that name and just rebranded as my my personal yeah. name lately. Okay, I see. So for us to wrap up, is there a message that you want to share with our audience? Something specific that you want to you want to end this podcast with? Um, I think I think just focus on what you really love to do and what you you enjoy because travel traveling is such a huge there's so many things that are involved with travel but let's say when i when i when i started traveling and when i started making videos when i started blogging i just had this general concept of travel and i'm going to try to cover everything possible in travel whether it's sightseeing history food and so i would like go to museums, I'd go to visit the top 10 list of things to do in a country. And of course, I'd be eating all at the same time. But then I realized, like, you know, I don't care that much about the top 10 list of things to do. 
I'm just doing it because that's what the top 10 list said to do. What I care about is hanging out with some people I meet for the first time and eating white meat <laughs> on the street. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I remember. That's what I'm going to remember about Baku. You know, hanging out with Adnan and just lamb filling the air, a laughing uncle grilling up white meat and, you know, hacking up a lamb or hiking through the, the mountains to get this peep, peep, peep dolmas, peep dolmas oh, wow. and this amazing ante, like chopping up the meat again and mixing it. So, so sure, the top 10 list is fantastic. And maybe that is your passion, which is great. Like have have your your own personal focus uh, when you travel, and I think that will be the most rewarding for you. Well, I can definitely sign in, sign off with this message. I, I, listen, There's, I think you beat us to the perfect ending of the first podcast, <laughs> and I think I, I I want to thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for coming to Azerbaijan. I want to thank you for accepting our invitation to join our podcast and I want to thank you for what you're doing because what you're doing is really very important um, to the world you show it mm -hmm. that's the importance um, and you make people want to try different things different paths and different approaches to travel and you show the beauty of different people and cultures. So thank you for that. Thank you. No, thank you for for inviting me for and for I mean, of course, it would not have been possible to travel around to visit these really off the beaten path places without your expertise and your arrangement and for your passion for that as well. So thank you. Yeah, it's been an honor to be here. Okay, Mark. Thank you very much for coming. It was a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Good luck with your next destination. I don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're going, but I hope it will be something exciting and hopefully from your wish list. Thank you. Thank you very much.